have tissues just in case. I like it. So Jen, you and your husband had a dream to open up a restaurant, right? We did. So tell us about this dream. It's, it's fairly simple, actually. We wanted to create a place that you could call home. Um, it, is a, uh, it was a casual neighborhood restaurant joint called Staple House, um, a restaurant that our approach to food focused on simplicity um, and finesse and shared the same stage as hospitality and connection with guests. What's happened now, however, this idea, this original dream has catapulted um, into something much larger than the original vision, though. So it started with tacos, yeah, tacos at the Heidingers, I think it was, tacos at the Heidingers. But now it turned to, into the Giving Kitchen and Staple House. Tell us about that. Absolutely. This, the story really begins in January of 2009 when uh, my husband and I started an underground supper club out of our home. Um, he was a chef, ran every kitchen he's ever been in. We both had full-time jobs. And um, every single Sunday, we would host uh, 10 guests at a time, um, strangers, in fact, um, into our home just to kind of share ourselves with them. We really felt um, that opening up a mom and pop shop really needed to start very organically, um, very vulnerably and very intimately. So we invited them into our home and that's how it all started. Um, later that year, we uh, hosted the infamous tacos at Heidinger's. It is the number one question that we still get asked uh, today. Um, when are you gonna do that taco party again? Um, we have a small house in Grant Park uh, here in Atlanta, and we hosted 200 people. Um, we had two live bands, uh, two whole roasted pigs, scratch pozole and scratch tacos. Um, we had a silent movie screening of the Three Amigos. It was really amazing. We charged $25 a head, lost our minds. We didn't make any money whatsoever <laughs> uh, for all you can eat and drink. Um, but it really obviously wasn't about making money. It was about starting this, you know, building these relationships. Um, that very next year, we uh, hosted another intimate dinner out of our home, again, still doing these dinners every single Sunday, but some big events every year, and this year was really awesome. Um, we paired up with Brickstore Pub in Decatur, um, and our dear friend Mike Gallagher brought his crew over and served beer, cooked dinner. It was, it was, it was awesome. It was a 40-person event. Um, the very next year, we teamed up with one of the premier urban farms here in Atlanta called Love is Love Farm. Um, again, another 40-person farm-to-table bounty feast. Um, served wine, served food, celebrated. It was really amazing. Um, over the course of about three and a half years, we, we received a lot of accolades. The, the press was really, really kind to us. Um, uh, you know, as everything was kind of was, was, was word of mouth. We didn't really put any effort into any sort of marketing or anything like that. Um, but the city was very trustworthy, uh, or trusting of us, um, and therefore um, we received some nice write-ups. Um, CNN and Daily Candy and a ton of Southeastern um, magazine publications. Um, it was really lovely. Everything was going really, really well. Um, of course, there were brick walls from locations to funding and setting up these business plans and them being rejected left and right. And, um, but overall, everything was going really well. I was working with my husband. We were a really good team. Um, and we were doing what we wanted to do. We were building a dream. We were creating this child. Um, and then everything changed. Um, it was December 21st of 2012. It was the end of the world, as the Mayans stated. Um, and very unexpectedly and out of the blue, my husband Ryan was diagnosed with stage four gallbladder cancer. Um, it was a very rare cancer. He was given less than 5% chance at survival. 90% of his liver was engulfed in tumors that had spread to his lungs. He was given six months to live. So, as you can imagine, a very dark cloud kind of reared its ugly head over our home for a while. This was right before Christmas. It was during Christmas weekend. We canceled our plans. We ended up not going back home to Indianapolis to visit family. We stayed at home and just snuggled um, and thought and um, tried to embrace one another as best we could. Um, 
And then all of a sudden, early January of 2013, a, a spark happened, a little click in Ryan's head. And it happened in his head, head first before it happened in me. Um, but it wasn't the, 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 you know, the roar of thunder or me patting his back from sobbing. It was just a light that went off in his head. And all of a sudden, his perspective changed, which changed mine. And all of a sudden, we just let go and let be. We completely accepted where we were in our journey together. Um, right after that, um, within days, we're talking right after New Year's, um, a dear friend approached us, a business mentor, and came to our dining room table and said, we have to help. And we declined, because young people decline help all the time. And um, he's very persistent, this, this business mentor. Um, he was, it was Ryan's boss at one of the kitchens he was running and said, we can't allow the financial barrier to become a burden on you going through this. We don't know what it will look like, um, but we can't, let it, uh, we can't let it stop what you need to do to survive. So we said, do whatever you need to do. We're going to focus on family and treatment options. Go. So within three weeks, three weeks, there was an event called Team Heidi, short for our last name, Heidinger, that was put on, formed um, at the end of January last year. 800 people came together and raised $275,000 for one couple. <laughs> this clearly was an unsolicited response. Um, it was life-changing. It was, we call it a love connection, a love fest, because you really couldn't get people off one another. Um, it, was, it was quite inspiring and amazing, and both Ryan and I got on stage to thank everybody shaking like I am now, and um, it, it, was, it was powerful. Mm. Um, and this, this need, um, there's obviously a, a need that was revealed from here, um, where within the restaurant um, industry in Atlanta, you know, there's, there's so many times that the restaurant industry is called upon to help with charitable organizations, and there's food and beverage here, and you know, you can't, um, you can't celebrate without food and drink. And so this um, idea really revealed a need um, to help out our own industry. And that is when the Giving Kitchen Initiative was introduced, um, our nonprofit. I actually have a staff member here right now. I'm very proud to see her in the front row. Um, the Giving Kitchen Initiative is a, an Atlanta-based 501c3. Um, we are here to help Atlanta restaurant workers who are affected by any sort of crisis or hardship, whether it's a catastrophic medical diagnosis, a natural disaster, death, a broken wrist for a bartender who can't work for a few weeks, whatever it is. What's really amazing now is that Staple House, my dream child, has become a for-profit subsidiary of this nonprofit, and our entire net profits at the end of every year will be donated into the Giving Kitchens Crisis Fund so we can help members of our Atlanta restaurant community. It's amazing, isn't it? So, Jen is very courageous in being here to tell her story. This past spring, earlier this year, Ryan passed away. And so tell us kind of what you've been processing, how that has happened, the good and the bad in that whole thing, of what you care to share. Sure. This crowd. I am actually sitting here today in a very unique position. Um, it, is, it is the number one reason why I'm here today is to potentially help anybody in this room who's gone through something very difficult. I'm an open book. Um, there's Ryan. This was taken last spring. He's real cute. Um, but I am. I'm really OK to talk about it. I'm here to kind of just give myself away to you in hopes that it might help you in some way. Um, I talked a little bit about kind of letting go and letting be um, early on um, last year. And I actually want to read quickly um, a passage from Ryan's journal that he wrote last year. He's a very introspective, brilliant writer. And um, this kind of sh um, paved the way that we really kind of chose to live life all of last year. Um, and it says, I'll read it quickly. It doesn't say live vibrantly, live fully, or live for one another, although I do believe that. Um, it says, a white cloud billows between the sun and I, and a slight chill blankets me in its shade. It means no harm. It's just doing what clouds do. 
There are all these levels to life. Harm isn't always the intent. Sometimes the layers overlap and what is completely normal to one form can harm another. This cancer isn't trying to kill me, it is just trying to survive. It's just like me, just like the human race. Expanding, shrinking with the environment, adapting, growing, and hanging on for dear life. As far as we can tell, no other species thinks this way. We are in the unique position to comprehend life and death, what is before and what is after. This is our blessing and this is our curse. And for me, I think it's a very um, great reminder of anything long-lasting and worthwhile um, really, truly takes time and complete surrender. Um, we traveled all over the country uh, last year. We did a lot of research, um, med traditional medical treatments to alternative therapies. Um, and, you know, we, we did as much research as we could with what we felt comfortable with. And there are ups and downs, and I'll give you one up. Um, with it, in the four months, the first four months of diagnosis, obviously it was fairly trying and challenging, but we got the first piece of good news within four months, and it was while we were at our cancer treatment center here in Noonan, Georgia. Um, and I remember um, it was the first time that we received the news that Ryan's tumor markers had started to decrease. And in the cancer world, in some cancers, it's a really good sign. It's a sign of good news. And I remember sobbing and my face turned bright red and puffy and Ryan was in his, sitting in his chemo infusion chair, just stoic and beautifully calm and just a slight grin on his, shoulder, on his, on his face. And I remember um, running over to him and mounting him, fully clothed. And <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, fully clothed, mounting my husband. And I, uh, somebody took a picture and I posted on Instagram and my caption was, happy wife mounting coy husband. Um, and it got like the most likes we've ever had. Um, but it really, it moved us and it was a powerful moment for us. After that, his health did start to decline. Um, and he actually had the opportunity to speak at Creative Mornings uh, in June of last year and left the audience with a really amazing, powerful challenge. Um, one that I kind of almost want to reiterate today. And he asked everybody to stop and imagine the unimaginable. He said, live as though you were just told that you had six months to live, and what the hell would you do with that time? And I think that's just a really good reminder for today, too. Um, we decided to choose in-home hospice care on December 16th of 2012 last year. It was challenging and a difficult um, decision to make. Um, and on January 9th of this year, he died in my arms. <laughs> It was the most profound thing I've ever witnessed in my entire life. It was beautiful. And to end on a slightly light note, <laughs> I would be remiss if I didn't tell you how funny or witty Ryan was. Um, also in his journal, at the very end, he um, wrote a passage, and the first line out of this particular uh, portion of text said, you can't spell funeral without fun. So, of course, we didn't host a funeral for him. We celebrated his life, um, and it was, it was amazing. That's awesome. And, and I know the community played a major role. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, that, when you did that first fundraiser and all the way through this entire process. Tell us how that has made you feel and what you've learned through that. Uh, I, I like to say I think we were given the biggest group of people to catch us in a trust fall. Um, it, was, it was really quite powerful, and I'm talking about thousands of people of which I don't know. Um, I think the energy of, of, that, um, of that group and, and the entire support system that we had all last year uh, really provided us with a peace of mind. Um, and I think our story resonates with a lot of people in this industry, um, not because of who Ryan and I are at all, but I, you know, we as humans are wired for empathy. Um, we are, our memory and our imagination allow us to consider somebody else's, you know, strife or consequence, and we want to naturally help out. And I think that's the exact definition of what community is, is gathering together to support and, and create and change something um, for the better. Um, and I think that's why the Giving Kitchen was really such a strong attractor as well. 
um, it really unified everybody within this industry, in the Atlanta restaurant community specifically, and now even much more. Um, and what's really amazing is that today, um, we are in the middle of granting um, individuals crisis grants today, um, and these are changing people's lives. I mean, this, these are people who don't get paid a lot. This is, you know, they go, they live, and they work, and that's it, and they don't receive giant paychecks. Um, and they s sever a finger, and they're out of work for weeks, and what do they do? They lose their car or their apartment. Um, and that's what makes this very, very pa powerful, is that we are literally changing people's lives within our own industry. It's great. Now, I think you and I have talked about this. I think in our culture, we don't use the word widow very often. But you are coming to grips with that's part of who you are. Mm -hmm. So what have you learned through that? I love claiming the word widow. It's a part of my journey, and it's now a part of my soul, and that's okay. Um, I'm, I mentioned earlier I'm in a really unique position to sit here in front of you today, to be very vulnerable and open and honest, and um, to speak on something that's very powerful to me, my business, Staple House, and my nonprofit organization, The Giving Kitchen. Um, and I'm able to speak on the biggest tragedy of my life, but claim it as the greatest gift I've ever been given. And I'd like to share four things that I think have, um, I've been able to kind of shuffle through and um, that relate to grief and loss, but things that I've been able to shuffle through and, and can slightly articulate. Um, for anyone out there, um, feel everything, um, no matter what it looks like. It can be joy, it can be sorrow and devastation, cry on your bathroom floor naked, or leap into a pool of water. It doesn't matter, do it, and do it for as long as it takes. Hold on to your pain and learn to fall in love with it. And I know that can sound a little bit odd, but I think in order to truly be able to step forward and move beyond the grayness, you really have to know what the pain feels like and looks like and tastes like. Um, I also think it's really okay to not be okay to do any of this. I chose to speak about it. I chose to give it away and talk about it because that's what's healing for me. But I think it's really okay to remember that you don't have to talk about it. You can be secluded for a while and in that, you know, that dark room um, with nothing in it and uncertain. And that's okay. Um, and I also remember and like to believe that I believe that everything in this world Every experience that we have really does come from our mind, um, our heart, our gut, our soul. Um, we use our senses um, every day to make um, decisions. And you right now in front of me, I'm, I'm going to, as soon as I walk away, I'll remember what you look like, but you won't be in front of me. And I think that's the exact same thing that happens to us when we die. You leave, but your spirit is still here because it's within my mind and my heart and my body. All right, on a happy note. Please. Can you show us some pictures about what Staple House is going to look like and taste like and explain to us what it's going to smell like? Yeah, What's Staple smell, House going to be? It's going to smell really good because we're cooking food. Uh, here is our building. We are at 541 Edgewood Avenue in Old Fourth Ward. And it's not for lease anymore. It is no sure. longer for lease. You can ignore that sign. Yes. We did sign their lease. Um, here's an interior shot. That's Ryan and I actually from sometime last year. Um, mm. We, Square Feet Studio um, is our architecture and design team that does a rendering they've done of the inside right near the host stand. Um, that is a side drawing. We're, we're really simple. We're only 50 seats inside. We have a patio. Um, no artwork, very simplistic, a very small bar. Um, our construction company is Choke Construction. I always like to mention those two because they've done quite a lot for us. And as I show these last two pictures of just some um, color schemes and color palettes and textures, um, I would be ris remiss to not mention my two business partners, my family members. Um, Ryan Smith will be our chef since my husband is no longer here. Um, he's the former executive chef of Empire State South and many other amazing restaurants here in town. And he will be at the helm in the kitchen. And then his beautiful wife, my sister-in-law, Kara Heidinger, uh, will run the front of house operations. Awesome. We're running out of time, so before we end, when will this place open, which is a, probably the million dollar question for you, and how can people get further involved to learn more about what you do? Well, you can go there. 
You can go to thegivingkitchen.org or staplehouse.com. We are um, right in the middle of the very tail end of permitting. Construction should start soon. Um, we're hoping maybe sometime in September. The construction time will take a little while, probably about four and a half months. Um, and so we hope to open January, February. Um, but definitely just check, check out thegivingkitchen.org especially. Uh, you can check out what we're doing, the grants that we're making, how to be a donor, how to be a volunteer, um, and how to make a direct impact on our community today. Jen, I think everyone in here is encouraged by your courage. And please help me in thanking her for sharing her story today. Oh, that's great. <laughs>